Welcome back to our studios here in Lahore. I'm Hamza Amjad and let's begin the bulletin with Iran. Now the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei says Tehran will continue to reduce its commitments under the 2015 nuclear deal. He accused European partners of not abiding by any of their commitments. Khamenei says Iran has always fulfilled its obligations but is now facing criticism for backtracking from the nuclear deal. Earlier, the EU said it does not see Tehran's actions as enough to break the deal. Foreign policy chief Federica Mogherini said EU members have no intention of triggering the Accords dispute process. Let's head to the UN, which has voiced concerns over the tough restrictions imposed by the US on Ira Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif's movement in New York. Iran's top diplomat is visiting the U.S. to attend a meeting at the U.N. headquarters. Despite issuing a visa to Zarif, the U.S. has barred him from moving beyond six blocks of Iran's U.N. mission in New York. Now, last month, Washington threatened to impose sanctions on Zarif, adding to tensions with Tehran. UK leadership hopeful Boris Johnson says he will not back the U.S. if it takes military action against Iran. Meanwhile, Foreign Minister Jeremy Hunt says that the US and Iran are not looking to start a war. Hunt and Johnson were taking part in the final head-to-head -head debate of the Conservative leadership campaign. The two candidates said even a significant concession from the EU on the Irish border would be insufficient. Both contenders stressed the need to de-escalate Gulf tensions. We are working to do at the moment is to try and de-escalate as many of the tensions as we possibly can because this is the one part of the world where if things go wrong they can go wrong in a very big and bad way and that's why we've absolutely got to be on our watch. The winner of UK's leadership race will be announced on July 23rd and May will officially relinquish the keys to 10 Downing Street on July the 24th. And let's move on now to Saudi Arabia, which says it is ready to support a peaceful political solution to the conflict in Yemen. Defence Minister Khalid bin Salman says that the kingdom is committed to the well-being of the Yemeni people. Meeting with UN Special Envoy Martin Griffiths, the Saudi Defence Minister called on Houthi rebels to uphold their signed commitments, including the Stockholm Agreement. Earlier, the UN said Yemen's warring sides have agreed to bolster a ceasefire deal and reduce tensions around the port of Hodeida. It said both sides have agreed on the technical aspects of a troop withdrawal. The UN Security Council has extended its ceasefire observation mission in Hodeida by six months. Moving on to North Korea, which has warned that the US-South Korea military drills will affect the proposed nuclear talks between Pyongyang and Washington. The Dongmaing military exercises are scheduled for next month. They could potentially jeopardize the resumption of negotiations between Washington and Pyongyang. US President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un met at the DMZ on the border with South Korea in June. Both leaders agreed to restart talks over North Korea's denuclearization over a period of three months. Eleven people have been killed in government airstrikes in Syria's northwestern Idlib province. War monitors say 14 others were injured in the strikes as fierce fighting for the control of the ceasefire zone rages on. They say that the Russian-led warplanes carried out two bombing missions over Idlib. Monitors say 16 air raids were carried out on the city of Khan Sheikhoun and the southern Idlib countryside over the last 24 hours. Over 2,000 people have so far been killed in the battle for Idlib, which started at the end of April. And let's go to Libya, where three medics have been killed in an airstrike by eastern Libyan forces led by military commander Khalifa Haftar. The Libyan government says that the attack hit a field hospital in southern Tripoli. The battle between Libya's UN-recognized government and eastern commander Khalifa Haftar has now entered its fourth month. The Libyan health ministry says over 1,000 civilians have been killed and over 4,000 wounded in the battle for Tripoli. Officials say another Palestinian detainee has died in an Israeli prison in unexplained circumstances. 
The Palestine Liberation Organization says Israeli forces detained Nassar Majid Takatka about a month ago in a raid on his home in the West Bank. He was detained for interrogation and then placed in solitary confinement at the Nitzan prison. The PLO says that the cause of Takatka's death is still unclear. His family says he did not have any health issues before his arrest. While the Palestinian Prisoners Club says that Taktagar's death brings the number of Palestinians who've died in Israeli custody since 1967 to 220. And at The Hague, the International Court of Justice will tomorrow announce its verdict on the Indian spy Kulbushin Jadav case. He was arrested in March 2016 while trying to illegally cross into Pakistan from Iran. Kulbushin's documents subsequently proved him to be an officer of the Indian Navy. Passports recovered from Jadav showed his businessman's identity was a fake. During the trial at The Hague, India's lawyers failed to answer questions around Jadav's dual passport identities. The Indian agent confessed to espionage and committing acts of terrorism during investigations in Pakistan. He said that the chief of India's external intelligence agency, RAW, was directly involved in planning and aiding sectarian and ethnic violence in Pakistan. He also confessed to helping the movement of arms and personnel into Pakistan by sea to support secessionists in the southwest Balochistan province. While well, Pakistan has fully reopened its airspace for Indian civil traffic after a five-month long standoff with New Delhi, Pakistan's aviation authority said the airspace is now open for all types of civilian traffic. The country closed its airspace in February in the wake of Indian Air Force attacks in northern Pakistan. Partial operations in Pakistan did resume when tensions softened. Pakistan lies in the middle of a vital aviation corridor. The restrictions affected hundreds of commercial and cargo flights each day. While well, rescuers have pulled out a coal miner alive after 40 hours trapped in a collapsed coal mine in Pakistan's Balochistan province. The bodies of eight others have also been recovered while a worker succumbed to his injuries in the hospital. Officials say the men were working 4,000 feet below the ground when they were trapped by an electrical fire. The director general of the PDMA, Imran Khan Zarkun, said only two miners could be rescued in the search operation, which has now concluded. Officials say the fire caused by a short circuit began the spread of poisonous carbon monoxide gas through the mine. Most coal mines in the province are notorious for their poor safety standards, as similar accidents have occurred in the past. Well, monsoon storms and flooding have wreaked havoc across South Asia, claiming 188 lives over the last five days. Nepal has been the worst hit with flash flooding and landslides, killing 78 people and injuring 30 others. 28 people have been killed and seven others injured in a flash flood in Pakistan's Neelam Valley. 28 people have lost their lives in northeastern India. 12 people have been killed by lightning in Bangladesh. Now, for more on this, we are joined by our New Delhi correspondent, Neha Punia. Thank you for joining us, Neha, and welcome to Indus News. So what are the officials in India, Nepal and Bangladesh saying about the scale of this humanitarian crisis that has been brought on by this monsoon season? The devastation has been uh, quite massive and widespread. When you speak of Nepal, about 10,000 people have been displaced. Uh, Nepal has been the worst hit with over 60 deaths reported and uh, the flooding there has been quite extensive, uh, so much so that many, uh, in many areas the flood waters are now flooding into the uh, North Indian state of Bihar that shares a border with Nepal. Uh, in Bihar, you've got uh, five rivers that are flowing in spate. Uh, the Chief Minister, Shafar Bak, held an aerial review of the worst hit areas as well. Many of those living in rural areas or living in makeshift homes are bearing the brunt of this deluge and uh, millions have been evacuated in Bihar. Uh, in Assam, which is the worst hit state in India, four million people have been displaced so far. 
the government has set up about uh, 200 odd relief centers. 83,000 people have been evacuated so far. The army and paramilitary forces have been pressed into the rescue and relief operations. Uh, and in Bangladesh, an area that's uh, not new to these kind of weather patterns, uh, about uh, 5,000 people have lost their homes. Many of them live in the Cox's Bazar district, uh, which is home to one million Rohingya refugees. Uh, these are concerns that were voiced uh, way back uh, at the beginning of the year that this area is going to be very vulnerable in the event of excessive rainfall or even flooding. Well, Neha, we do see that the monsoon season every year, especially in South Asia, wreaks so much havoc. Why don't the relevant authorities do anything beforehand to prevent this? You're right in saying that this area is not new to, to seeing this kind of deluge. In fact, uh, in the state of Assam and Bihar, we see these kind of headlines every year. It's a similar story in Bangladesh and Nepal as well. And that's the question that authorities are also grappling with. After last year's devastating floods in Assam, the government said it is working on flood mitigation plans, uh, essentially ensuring that uh, the embankments of rivers are strengthened. Uh, there, there would be a closer look at the kind of encroachment that's happened on riverbeds and the kind of urbanization that takes place uh, in a completely unchecked fashion. Uh, but uh, uh, this is a twofold problem. One, we're also seeing because of uh, climate change, uh, weather patterns have become more intense. They've become uh, slightly uh, less predictable. So that is one problem that authorities are dealing with. Two, of course, uh, like I said, the human intervention problem, which will need a long-term solution. The government also admits here in India that often evacuating people from their homes, especially in rural areas, is a massive challenge. Uh, so that is an aspect that the government says they're going to be working on in the years ahead. Well, that was our New Delhi correspondent, Neha Punia. Once again, thanks for joining us. And let's remain in India, where two women have been killed and around 50 people are feared trapped under rubble after a four-story building collapsed in Mumbai. The officials say that National Disaster Response Force and police are trying to dig out survivors. Mumbai police spokesperson DCP Manjunath Singhe says three people, including a child, have been rescued so far. The officials say the 100-year-old structure was not in the list of dangerous buildings released each year before the start of the monsoon season. Moving on to Indonesia, where a strong earthquake has struck off the holiday island of Bali. The European Earthquake Monitoring Agency says that the 6.1 magnitude tremor was centered about 82 kilometers southwest of the island capital, Denpasar. Residents fled their homes as the earthquake damaged buildings. There were reports of damage in schools, temples and residential areas. The transport ministry says Bali Airport is operating normally. This follows a powerful 7.3 quake in the Maluka Islands on Sunday that killed at least two people. Now, five Afghan soldiers and 11 Taliban fighters have been killed during clashes in northern Afghanistan. Four soldiers and seven insurgents were also wounded. The military says that the clashes erupted after Taliban fighters stormed security checkpoints in the Faryar province. Meanwhile, Afghanistan's Independent Human Rights Commission says that almost 600 civilians have been killed over the last three months. The commission says almost 2,000 others were wounded in clashes between government forces and Taliban insurgents. The head of the commission, Musa Mahmoudi, says over 700 children have been killed or wounded. Mahmoudi criticized the government for not doing enough to prevent the civilian casualties. The defense ministry disputes the report's findings, saying it is taking every measure to protect civilians during its operations. French President Emmanuel Macron has demanded an explanation from Iran over the detention of academic Fariba Adilkar. The 60-year-old academic researcher was arrested in June by the Revolutionary Guards, reportedly on suspicion of espionage. The, con the controversy over the dual national's arrest comes as Paris and Tehran are engaged in crisis talks to save the 2015 nuclear deal. France's foreign ministry has demanded consular access to Adil Khan without further delay. Iran's government has confirmed her detention but has not said why she is being held. Turkey says that the EU's decision to curb contacts and funding will not affect its drilling for gas off the coast of Cyprus. The Turkish foreign ministry has also condemned the European Union's decision to suspend high-level talks on the divided island. 
It accused the EU of being biased and partisan over Cyprus. This comes after Austria and Germany proposed new sanctions on Turkey at a meeting of the EU's Foreign Affairs Council. The Council decided to suspend negotiations on an air transport agreement with Ankara. It also agreed to temporarily end high-level dialogue with Turkey. Ankara stands to lose, lose 150 million euros in pre-accession EU funding earmarked for 2020. Well, a Venezuelan government delegation has arrived in Barbados to take part in a new round of talks with the opposition. The negotiation aims to establish a peaceful mechanism to settle disputes. President Maduro's communication minister, Jorge Rodriguez, says the government is trying to find a constitutional and democratic resolution to the differences. Envoys representing opposition leader Juan Guaido at the talks say they are aiming for a change in government. Last week, rival factions agreed to set up a platform for negotiations mediated by Norway after three days of talks on the Caribbean island. And let's head to the UK where climate activists in London have blocked all entrances to the country's biggest cement manufacturer, halting supplies for a road tunnel under the River Thames. There are demonstrations in five other British cities as the Extinction Rebellion continues to press the government to act against climate change. Environmental activists have set up pickets and a sit-in at the entrance of London Concrete. The group says it will disrupt the site all day in an attempt to halt an expansion of the workers. Globally, it's inextricably linked to CO2 emissions, which are filling the living world that we're part of. And I mean, locally, it's creating a lot of dust pollution that is adding to already bad air pollution in East London. Environmental campaigners have called on the British government to declare a climate emergency. And let's move on to Italy, where doctors in Rome have warned people to stay away from roadside garbage dumps. Stray animals feasting on the piles of trash have created a possible health emergency. Meanwhile, locals, locals are fuming over the lack of waste management in the city. More in this report. Any mention of Rome usually brings the city's cultural heritage or great Italian food to mind. But nowadays, tourists are navigating overflowing rubbish bins in the stifling heat. Doctors have warned the city may have a health emergency on its hands. With this heat and with this situation, there could be a hygienic emergency in the sense that we must remain vigilant to avoid that it could turn into a health emergency. Prevention is better than a cure, as they say, so we decided to alert all the institutional actors in the system. The garbage also attracts animals which cause even more problems. I live in the center where it's even worse because there are seagulls, mice, all kinds of animals, mosquitoes, flies full of insects and animals. That's enough. Locals blame the government, which they say is corrupt to the core. This is the most disorganized capital in the world. For everything, for buses too, everything. If something goes wrong, it's in Rome for sure. On the 10th of July, Environment Minister Sergio Costa vowed to resolve the problem within 15 days. Rome generates 5,000 tons of garbage daily, and the city doesn't even have its own incinerator. The scale of the problem combined with the government's alleged inefficiency makes it unlikely Costa will be able to deliver on his promise. For now, though, overflowing dumpsters are as much a feature of Rome as the Colosseum or the Pantheon. Meanwhile, in France, authorities are aiming to run an island on green energy by 2021. Nicolas de Glenan is part of an archipelago that welcomes some 3,000 visitors a day and houses the largest sailing academy in Europe. Take a look. The Nicolas Archipelago is already equipped with a wind turbine and two solar power plants. Now authorities plan to run one of its islands exclusively on renewable energy. 
Here you can see the island's current consumption, which is around 8 kilowatts. Photovoltaic production is around 26 kilowatts, and the wind turbine produces around 5 kilowatts. And so the energy management system allows us to reach an equilibrium between consumption and production. And it is a subsidiary of state-owned power utility has invested over $280,000 into the project. Whether on an island or elsewhere in France, photovoltaics will develop in a massive way. Electric vehicles, so part of the storage, will develop. The linky meter is growing and so we will have to be able to balance the network in real time. The island has no connection with the mainland's electricity grid and it's been increasing its reliance on renewable energy since the 1990s. Well, first up in the world of business, China has increased its government spending by nearly 11% in the first half of the year to boost economic growth. The finance ministry says spending surge has easily outpaced the revenue growth of 3.5%. China has already reported weakened economic growth down to 6.2% in the second quarter, which is the slowest in 27 years. Tax revenues grew at under 1%, down from over 5% in the first quarter. Most economists expect Beijing to find other ways to boost its economy as the trade war with the US grinds on. Meanwhile, Facebook says that it will not proceed with the launch of its Libra cryptocurrency until regulatory concerns are addressed. This comes after US President Donald Trump said the social media giant must obtain a banking charter before launching its digital token. US Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin also voiced serious concerns about Libra, saying it could be used for illicit activity. Facebook says Libra has no intention of competing with any sovereign currencies or entering the monetary policy arena. Vice President David Marcus says the platform will fully address regulatory concerns and has already received appropriate approvals. Well, it's been raining cats and dogs here in Lahore due to the monsoon. Let's take a look at the weather around the world. Well, that was all I have from the bulletin at the moment, but do stay tuned to Indus News for further updates. And as always, thanks for watching.